Now let's look at the role of banks in the money supply process. A bank is simply a financial institution that uses liquid assets in the form of bank deposits to finance the illiquid investment of borrowers. So a bank takes deposits from its customers which is its primary source of funding, converts it into a loan, charges a higher interest rate on that loan, and it pays zero or a very low interest rate on the deposit that it holds. This process is called asset transformation, and it is also the primary way that banks make money or profits. Banks also hold something that we call reserves. Bank reserves can be split into two types. The first is its vault cash or the currency held inside the bank. And secondly, banks also hold a deposit at the central bank. These deposits are referred to as settlement balance accounts. So together, the vault cash and account at Bank of Canada pick up the reserves of the financial system. You can think of reserves as the most liquid asset that banks hold. So whenever we have deposit withdrawals, people withdrawing their money from a checking or saving account, banks are going to use these reserves that they hold in order to meet such withdrawal requests. So if I withdraw $1,000 from my checking account, bank is going to give me $1,000 from its gold cash and hence its reserves will go down by $1,000. Do banks hold most of the deposits that they hold of their customers in the form of cash or currency? Absolutely not. As we've already said, most of these deposits held by banks are already converted into interest earning assets like loans. They only keep a fraction of these deposits as reserves and this fraction is referred to as the reserve ratio. In Canada, there is no requirement to hold a certain fraction of deposits always as reserves. However, banks always do keep some reserves in order to meet their liquidity drains and therefore this reserve ratio is referred to as the desired reserve ratio in Canada. So we can think of our desired reserves as the fraction of deposits held by banks in order to meet their liquidity requirements. For example, if a bank is holding a total of $1,000 in deposits and the reserve ratio is 10%, desired reserves in this case is only $100. It will always keep at least $100 in order to meet withdrawal requests or other such liquidity drains. Next, we're going to put down everything in the form of a T account. A T account simply summarizes the financial position of a business. For a business entity, assets are something that it owns. So any building machinery that it has, that is an asset for the business and hence will be put under assets on the left hand side of the T account. Whereas any liabilities, that is money that it owes, will be put on the right hand side. Equity or capital is simply your total assets minus total liabilities and equity or capital is always put under liabilities. Let's now draw the T accounts for a hypothetical chartered bank, our first street bank. Assets will be its reserves and loans. It could also be securities that it holds. So if it's holding any Government of Canada bonds, that will also be a part of its assets. For now, I'm assuming it's only reserves and the loans that it is giving to its borrowers. The main liabilities of a chartered bank are the deposits of its customers. Remember that the deposit that you have at a chartered bank is an asset for you, but it is a liability for that particular bank because it is your money that they owe it to you anytime you wish to have it back. And again, equity or capital is total assets minus total liabilities. So we can draw the hypothetical T account for First Street Bank, where I have its total deposits of a million dollars. It has given out loans of $1.2 million. It's holding reserves of $100,000. And total assets minus total liabilities is giving you equity of $300,000. Note that your T accounts will always balance each other. So the total on my right hand side will always sum up to be exactly equal to the total on my left hand side. Now that we understand our T accounts for a financial institution, let's see how they play a role in the money supply process. Now before we go there, remember creation of money supply or reduction of money supply is not the end goal of a chartered bank. For them, they're just doing their daily business activities. They're converting deposits into loans in order to make profits for themselves. But in doing so, they will end up changing up money supply. So let's start with this example where we are turning cash into a deposit. So we're assuming the reserve ratio is 10%. So banks will always hold at least 10% of the deposits as reserves in order to meet their liquidity drains and the remaining amount will be converted into a loan. So we're assuming the new deposit is of $1,000. 
So you can see on my right hand side, deposits are increasing by $1,000. As soon as there is a deposit inflow, bank reserves or its vault cash is also increasing by $1,000. In this first step, you can see there's no change in loans, there's no change in equity. Total assets again equal our total liabilities. Once the bank knows that it has $1,000 as new deposit, it will keep 10% of those as desired reserves and that is $100. But its overall reserves are $1,000. Anything over and above its desired reserves is referred to as excess reserves. So in this case, the bank has excess reserves of $900. These $900 of excess reserves will be now given out as new loans. And that's what we're seeing over here. So what happens to these new loans? Every time bank makes a new loan, it essentially creates a new deposit of $900. So in my first column, I have the change in checkable deposits. And the second column is showing you the change in loans. And in the last column, I'm tracking the overall change in money supply. Note when there was initial change in currency into a new deposit of $1,000, this does not increase our money supply because this money supply is, remember, simply currency plus deposits. So as one transfers into the other, overall money supply is unchanged. It's when the bank sees that it has excess reserves of $900, it will convert them into new loans. So bank had a new deposit of $1,000, kept $100, and the remaining nine 90% are given out as new loans. These new loans are causing our money supply to increase by $900 because they were essentially converted into a new deposit in the financial system. Now this new deposit could be at the same bank or at some other bank in the financial system. As soon as this new deposit is created, the bank again keeps the desired reserves of 10% and the remaining 90% are given out as new loans and hence a new deposit of 810, essentially increasing our money supply by $810. This new deposit of 810 repeats the same process. Bank keeps 10% of these. The remaining 729 are given out as new loans and therefore a new deposit of 729 is created, increasing our money supply by 729. So overall, our money supply is changing over here in this last column. And as you can see, a new deposit of $1,000 does not increase money supply by just 1000 it has a ripple effect on our financial system. Money supply will increase by many times more than the initial effect on our excess reserves generated by the new deposit. So whatever the initial excess reserves were created, we will have some multiplied effect on that and that will give you your total effect on deposits. In this example, the initial excess reserves that were created were $900 and our multiplier is what we now want to find out next. What is this multiplier that will give us our total total effect on deposits in the system. And we can rewrite our overall change in deposits in this format, which is simply my last column in my previous slide. If I take the 900 common, this is changing my initial equation into this format. And this arithmetic series can be condensed into 900 times 1 over the reserve ratio. So my total change in deposits equals my change in initial excess reserves times 1 over the reserve ratio. And this 1 over reserve ratio is what we call our money multiplier. Note that the money multiplier will always be bigger than 1 because your reserve ratio is a fraction. It's a decimal number. So in our case, 1 over 0 0.10 will give you a money multiplier of 10. This 10 is telling you that every $1 in reserves will support deposits of $10. Or in our case, excess reserves increase by $900. And as they go through this multiple deposit creation in the financial system, they will cause our overall deposits to increase by 10 times of this 900, which is $9,000. So our total deposits increase by 9,000 and overall change in deposits translates into your overall change in money supply and therefore money supply increases by $9,000. This process can also happen in the reverse order. So if we withdraw money from our checking account, that will reduce reserves by the exact same amount. Now, banks, remember, only hold a fraction of reserves against the total deposits that they're holding. So if they are giving you your money back, they'll have to now call back loans for the remaining amount. So for example, I withdraw $1,000. Bank was only holding $100 against my deposit. The remaining $900 will now be called back and that will initiate now a deposit contraction process. 
So the process is the same, but just happening in the reverse order. Overall, now your total deposits will decrease by the multiplier times the initial decrease in excess reserves or the amount of loans that you now need to call back. Monetary base is our currency and reserves. Do not confuse your monetary base with your money supply. Money supply was currency and deposits in our economy. Monetary base note will always be much smaller than the money supply. Currency is the common factor, whereas reserves and deposits are distinctively different from each other. Our previous example elaborated on this fact that a dollar of reserves can support a much larger amount of deposits in the banking system because of the multiplier or the multiple deposit creation effect. This Venn diagram over here is elaborating on the same. You can see your monetary base, high powered money in the economy, currency and reserves is a much smaller amount, whereas the money supply is a multiple of your monetary base. We can use our concept of the multiplier to look at the relationship between monetary base and money supply. Money multiplier is simply the ratio of the money supply to the monetary base. So I can rewrite this equation as money supply is some multiple of our monetary base, where this multiple is equal to one over reserve ratio in our simple deposit creation model that we just saw. So each dollar of bank reserves will back several dollars of bank deposits, making the money supply much larger than the monetary base. Note that your chartered bank cannot affect the monetary base. They have no control over the total currency and reserves in our financial system. However, through their lending facilities to their customers, they can affect the money supply in our economy. Now that we understand the role of chartered banks in the money creation process, Let's now move on to the central bank and see how does central bank participates in this money supply process. 